So since we already did the introductions, again, welcome to Share Me's Lifelong Learning Series. It's a pleasure to welcome Marilyn Price and Rabbi David Toich. So, uh, so let's begin. So um, I guess first, Marilyn and David, can tell us a little bit about your collaboration and your partnership. I know that the two of you have been friends for quite some time. Um, is this the first time that you've collaborated? Um, is this sort of the latest in a series of? And, and how did you come together to, uh, to, to put this book together? Can we go in alphabetical order, David? Do you want to start? <laughs> we met in 1980 when um, I attended my first Reconstructionist convention in Indianapolis. And um, I've worked for the Reconstructionist movement ever since, though I am a graduate of Hebrew Union College. That's where I was ordained. Um, and Marilyn uh, and, and her husband, Roger, have been involved in the Reconstructionist movement for um, many years. And uh, Marilyn uh, ser was serving on the board of the rabbinical college when I was president. So we did a lot of collaborating together um, in, in that capacity. Um, but we, and, and we often have spoken uh, as part of the same program, uh, but we had never worked on a book project together before this one. And it was really um, Marilyn's idea that we should should tackle that. You want to pick good. up from there? That was really good. Um, I just like to say one word of, of thanks to this community. Um, I visited this com your community in person on March 6th and 7th in the year 2020. That may sound familiar. Mm -hmm. um, and on March 6th, I had lunch with my colleague David to celebrate his birthday the next day. And then I thought something was a brewing. So I got on the plane and landed in Chicago on March 7th and stayed there for a very long time. So for me, this is like bookends. And, uh, and I thank you for all coming tonight. I know there's lots of things and we are a little burned by this media because I know how good you look in person. So uh, David left very little out. One of the things we collaborated on a lot of was I have a, uh, an odd interest in that is I like to raise money for good organizations. So David and I would go around the country and ask people for money, but not to worry, not happening here. Um, the book, we, we did some other activities together. We worked on projects together, but not a book. David was always busy writing his own books. He edited Kol Shema, the prayer book series, and wrote a variety of things, including the guide to Jewish living uh, what I think like about these three really big tomes and he's now going to go show them to you. <laughs> um, in the meantime, I, on the other hand, was writing um, kids stories and uh, short stories in an alphabet Aleph, um, from Aleph Bait book uh, with using puppets and a variety of other things, clearly different subjects. We do share a variety of things which brought us together. One is the love of Judaism. And I am always looking at different ways to teach the beautiful language of Judaism through the everyday, which would be the stories that I tell. So I use props, as you could probably tell them surrounding me, in the form of puppets and objects. And I love to use stories to bring us closer to what some may think are an antiquated but very usable, beautiful blessings. And the truth about the collaboration in that it was my idea uh, isn't exactly accurate. Not David got it exactly right, but it was actually somebody that did, Chuck, Rabbi Briskin mentioned to, sorry, earlier, and that was my brother and I were gonna write a book sort of like this. And I didn't want him to retire and not use this great brain. So I asked him if he would like to write a book. And he said, yes, he was going to write a book about how stories come from um, liturgy, not just liturgy from Torah text. That did not happen, although I have notes. And I, I love the idea of it. So moving forward with that, I asked David while he was unfortunate unfortunately for me, in the middle of one of his huge projects. And he said, but wait, wait. And so I did, I'm very patient. Mm -hmm. 
and um, we started to write. And the interesting part about that is that he lives in Philadelphia and I live in Chicago, but we are really good friends. We share a great deal. And so this book was written uh, via the phone, not even on Zoom. This was way before all of that happened because Zoom was around, but we didn't do FaceTime. And then we would meet in an occasional meeting. So the book sort of grew uh, conversations. And um, his take on the blesseds and my take on the blesseds and the gratitude really come out the same, although we started differently. And that comes in the uh, intro in our book where we talk about the same subjects in a back and forth manner uh, in my growing up and in his growing up. So, um, and I think that actually speaks well of bringing in just about everybody into the, in, into the mix. And certainly in these days, when there seems at times that there isn't as much to be grateful for. Uh, I love that this book sits on my bedstead as it does in a lot of people who have it. And they look at it and they find something new in it every day because just like Torah, uh, things change as the days change. But gratitude is basically always the same. So how'd I do today? That was great. So Thank you. For, for me, part of the motivation behind this book is knowing that we live in a culture which is profoundly secular. And uh, part of secular secularity is seeing things in value neutral terms. And part of what Jewish tradition brings is a sense of wonder and uh, sense of the value in the lives we share. And uh, so the, the Jewish vision of the world is value laden as opposed to values free. And uh, much of the liturgy of Jewish tradition is about not letting us forget how many gifts we receive and how wondrous our lives can be. And uh, the impetus for blessing is about uh, gratitude and appreciation and uh, a recognition of the value that we're surrounded with. And that is a wonderful antidote to the value-free secularism that we have bombarding us all the time from a variety of sources. So for me, part of the excitement of this book is saying, wow, you know, there are so many opportunities we have to become aware of the blessings in our lives. And when we have that awareness, that awareness can, has transformative power. That's a great segue into uh, perhaps a look at the first blessing that I'd like you to maybe unpack mm -hmm. a little bit. And really, it's actually, um, uh, just comes from what you had just said, David, and I. You, you can you can very much tell that that this is a Jewish book because after after chapter one, which is the introduction, the first series of blessings are blessings over food. So clearly, it is a it is a, a, a Jewish book. Um, I didn't know. <laughs> there you go. Yes. So, and just uh, and just so folks recognize, um, the book contains. Uh, I, I didn't count exactly how many blessings um, you have in here, but there are are there a hundred or they're just. There are many, maybe not quite a hundred, but there are many blessings in here. You know, 52. 52. Categorized for food and nature, for the senses, blessings for the body, uh, for Shabbat and holidays, and from special occasions as well. But I thought that uh, since food is where we begin, I think that, um, David, what you were saying, um, uh, just about the idea of, of value neutral, but how we also recognize you know, the great blessings in our lives. When we think about mozi, for example, um, a blessing that some of us say any time or before we eat, before we eat bread, any time. Um, most of us say it at the very least on Shabbat when we when we break bread and we and we go in, into our challah. Um, and we know that the translation, as you've translated here, David, uh, is blessed are you, eternal one, our God, the sovereign of all wor worlds, who brings forth bread from the earth. And then the next question, and I'm and I'm not sure if 
you know, it's sometimes it's hard. To, I mean, I sometimes know who's writing this and sometimes not. I like that sort of the, the delightful ambiguity. But the question is, why doesn't the blessing say who brings forth wheat from the earth? Um, just tell me a little bit about, um, I mean, for both of you, you I'm not going to read what's next, but uh, but your, your thinking in terms of how we recognize sort of that um, that process, which is more than just the agricultural process, but it's also the human and the labor process of, um, of, of the simple act of eating for maybe something that we may not um, take for granted too much, too often. There are several things that I think are really interesting about that blessing. Um, one of them is that brings forth motzi mm -hmm. is um, the same root as God brought us forth from Egypt. Mm -hmm. The bringing forth is, is, is the uh, he feel form to, if you know Hebrew grammar, of um, yotze or yitzia, which to, to go forth. So, and what do we bring forth? Well, God brings soil and rain and sun, and we bring, we in the form of the farmer, tilling and seeding and harvesting. And then the miller grinds that wheat after it's harvested and the baker bakes it so and then for most of us there's a truck that delivers it to a store and somebody who sells it to us so it in that blessing is a model of the divine human partnership what god gives us and what we give each other so when we think about who brings forth bread it's who brings forth all of the steps in the chain between the start of that growing process and the bread that ends up in our mouths. So who brings forth bread is a powerful statement of the way in which we are utterly dependent on others. We are dependent on the divine for sure, but we're no less dependent upon all the other human beings who contribute to the food chain and the chain that results in our having clothes and homes and so on. Um, when we recognize the power of those gifts, um, we can, we stop taking things for granted that are all around us every day. Thank you, Marilyn, please. Um, in my, I don't know how to, I raised reform, I'm still at, a, and now at a reform congregation, but in my reform growing up, we didn't do blessings. What we did was, uh, we did the after meal blessing by thanking my mother for cooking the meal. We were not allowed to leave the table until we thanked the person who had made the meal. And then we did some chores, but uh, as I think of this particular blessing as, yes, all the things David said, the, the cooperation between the people who make the bread and the wonder that we all should appreciate. But I also think of this blessing as a way to gather the family together or yourselves, even if it's just one. I say the blessing when I'm eating by myself and what it does in a, I'm sure all my dietitian friends would love this, it slows you down. I mean, we sit at the table and we want to jump in at the food uh, and, and eat it, and we aren't appreciating what we have. So this particular blessing, and all the others, some of the blessings over diverse food are, are just lovely blessings because they cover everything. But I consider this the hold up for just a minute and let's say and thank. Um, in the book, I wrote a story about an instant I saw, I was in Atlanta, and sitting at a table next to me was a couple I assumed were dating. Um, you could tell by the way they look at each other, you know what I mean? And they were getting to know each other. And, and the food came, and this couple, which had been so intense upon each other, before they ate, this man reached over and took, with her agreement, of course, took her hand, and they blessed together. 
this food and then they ate. I mean, it was the most interesting and lovely in the middle of a restaurant and it wasn't quiet. I could hear what they were saying. Uh, so I kind of felt like I was included in the blessing too. So I strongly recommend if you can, uh, we've had people ask us, but I don't know the Hebrew can, is it legitimate to say the, of course it is. You can, you know, learn it. That would be cool. But um, say, say something before you jump in at the table. And if you want to even include putting the napkin on your lap, which of course is something I'm still trying to teach my grandchildren. So um, there's a lot of good reasons to incorporate the blessings of 2000 years of age, not just to say thanks, to feel grateful, but to become a part of our lives. So one of the rabbis uh, in the Midrash um, comments that the shortest permission, the permissible blessing is thank you, God. Um, so if, if you're puzzling about all that Hebrew stuff, thank you, God actually works pretty well. Um, uh, there, there's a rabbi I go out to lunch with uh, from time to time and um, she always just stops when the food comes and we just are silent for a minute and that works too. Mm -hmm. One of the things I learned from David and and my brother David was that it, it's okay to say blessing out loud. And we're in a country where we can do that. So, and that's another good reason to do it, to say a blessing out loud so people can hear and be. And some of our blessings are very lovely and should be incorporated, so. And, and there's a real advantage in using the inherited blessing formula um, because it covers an enormous amount of ground. Um, for example, the word Baruch, which is the first one in every blessing, that has the root Beit Reish Haf, which uh, is the same as knee, because one of the ways that we acknowledge is by bending the knee. That was much more common among Jews, by the way, before Christians started doing it. And Jews started doing it less because Christians did it more. But to bend the knee is to humble oneself. So um, that's there. But the other meaning in Baruch is um, the same as in the modern Hebrew word brecha, which means a spring or a pool. And uh, you know, in the world of, of desert lands where water is precious, to, to say that God is Baruch is a way of saying God is the wellspring of life. So we humble ourselves before the wellspring of life just in the word Baruch. Um, and we then say Ata, which is a way of saying this blessing comes from beyond me. You bring it to me. The you means I am not responsible for all the good that comes to me. It's a gift to me. Adonai, Eloheinu, our God, because every time you say a blessing, you acknowledge that you're not just there as an individual, you're there as part of a community. Um, you say our God because you know that saying the blessing is also a way of binding you to everyone else who says that blessing formula. Melech HaOlam or Ruach HaOlam, the, the ruler of the universe or the inspirator of the universe, the one that gives the uni universe its capacity to function as one. Um, Melech HaOlam, ruler of the world. And then you go on to save the particular part for that blessing. Um, so when you don't rattle those words off as if they were insignificant, you actually re-encounter a whole worldview in those first few words. Uh, no one ever explained that to me growing up. They just made me memorize blessings. And so I was quite surprised when I finally got around to poking at each word to find that there was a lot more in them then the translation in a prayer book really gives yeah. much of a hint of. 
thank you. What a just a great um, exegesis of those, uh, just of that of the way that our blessings are formulated. Um, I think it's very easy for us to, as you said, David, just rattle off a blessing or just sort of dig in um, without really thinking or being mindful of uh, what we're about to eat. Um, now, so I was reflecting um, at the end of a meal. Uh, anyone who has uh, been to a major Jewish event or to summer camp, um, and maybe even in some of our homes, um, we are familiar with Birkat Hamazon, just the blessing after the meal, which is unlike the one-liner motzi, um, which can be said slowly and intentionally. Birkat Hamazon, in its traditional form, is is quite lengthy, you know, several paragraphs and whatnot, just with the with the essence of thanking God for for food. Um, anyone who has spent any time in a summer camp uh, may have heard I with with uh, <laughs> may have heard this particular blessing at the end of um, mm -hmm. of the end of a meal, which is um, was it uh, rub a dub dub thanks for the grub yay God. And anyone has heard that one before? Have you heard that one, Marilyn? For sure, yeah, David no, has. No, no camp I Maybe. would go. No, okay, yeah. So maybe I mean, maybe that's only like at, at our you know at our esteemed. You know, I I'm more familiar with the, with our URJ camps and whatnot. But um, but you know, but one of the one of the things I learned um, you know, in I mean, 10, 15 years ago or so was the sort of a shorter you know Aramaic version of Birkat Hamazon, sort of like the the, the one liner. And you also include um, just the one line blessing at the end of a meal here. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Al Haaretz al hamazon blessed are you eternal one our god the sovereign of all worlds for the land and the food um, and i was also really touched by um i think it was marilyn's story about um the uh, your the your tipping father or was that your story david i'm not That's sure. my father. <laughs> okay yeah. so. i think everyone though of any generation had a, a my mother-in-law always left a dollar it, it, that was just what you did. Right. She thought that was enough. Uh, and she loved people. It was just that that's the way she was raised. So we would always um, circle around <laughs> and leave a little bit something extra. Uh, right. and, and my dad too, they, right. they just thought it was, I was looking actually for something that kids get and it's here somewhere. Um, David and I spent a, a week at a camp in the Poconos at a Jewish camp and we gave the each cabin 20 minutes to create a visual of all of these blessings um and they did a great job we, we did a little study it was like seven minute dating or whatever that thing is because that's how long they had and they would work together and then they would create pictures uh, and that happened because my granddaughter Romy who is um sprightly to say the least told me she said you know grandma this is a beautiful book she had to say, this is this is how she operates. She said, this is a beautiful book, but you need pictures. Kids need pictures. And I said, I need pictures, I'm a visual learner. And I said, you know, that's a good idea. So we, David and I started this project and uh, he generously agreed to go. And our friend, it was a wonderful camp. And we did, it was called Draw Me a Blessing. I don't know, it, it has been published by me and the Kinko's Press down the road. And I think there's two copies in a PDF somewhere in the world. But what they did in visually expressing the blessing, as I explained it to them, we explained it to them is, I want you to walk down the street and see something and know it should be blessed. Because, and I want you to be able to look at a picture. I'm trying to find you one that is particularly lovely and get, what the blessing is without having words. There are a lot of people that can't read, especially under five. So this was one they did. And the one about after the meal was particularly lovely because I had some trouble explaining it. You know, what does that mean? Why do we do it? But this one is upon wakening. And, and that's the world. And this was done by a group of kids in 20 minutes who got it. They get it. And they got it because they get how to visualize things. And adults do too. I've done this with, with adults as well. It's a wonderful project. I'd be happy to share with your school. Um, so some of these just lend themselves to such vision. And the one on, in food, of course, who doesn't like eating? And who doesn't, isn't usually when you take a minute or two, if you've, any of you have flown lately, um, the snacks are minimal at best. 
and uh, and you can only and you have to eat and put your mask back on. I, I flew today, and uh, and it's it's not that I eat a lot on a plane, but just knowing that you might get a cup of coffee and lower your mask, sip, put your mask up, um, and you're grateful. I was grateful for that coffee. I hadn't had any. So, but but the concept of all that we need to go through and be grateful that a scientist is out there to make way for us to be able to do the things that we used to do. And I don't know if yet, Rabbi Teutsch, anyone has thought about, a. I mean, we could use the blessing on seeing a wise person when you encounter someone who has helped us in these times. So uh, maybe we could, you know, put one together. Um, you went out there, wanna try? What you said, um, Chuck, about uh, about grace after meals reminded me of one of my favorite pieces of Talmud. The rabbis asked the question, what kind of grace after meals do you say if um, brigands are breaking in your front door and you have to run out the back? And of course, the language of the Talmud is Aramaic. And so they come up with a, a one-liner, brich rachamana malka da alma mare da hai pita. Brich rachamana, that's blessed is the merciful one. Malka da alma, that's melech olam, ruler of the world. Mare da hai pita, the provider of the food of life, pita. And that's a word you probably know. Um, and um, and that's actually been set to music. So if you're looking for another short Birkat Amazon, that one works great. Right, and that's yeah, and that's a um, that's one that I I think I first learned that. I want to say uh, it might have been at um, at an Institute for Jewish Spirituality um, conference that I was at, which is um, I think it was that was very popular within those circles, and uh, I think that my own experience with blessings has been, especially when it comes to some of the daily liturgy is sometimes shorter, but repetitive, um, gets a little bit deeper at it. Almost like when you take a blessing like that and you turn it into a chant and you go over and over, and, you know, you may realize that by the time you, you stop chanting, it may have be equivalent in length as a full traditional Birkat Hamazon, but you've really kind of focused on, you know, those six or eight words and really gotten a tremendous amount of depth from them, which I think is what's really beautiful about the blessings that are contained here in the book is that these are the short one-liner blessings. You know, this isn't, this isn't liturgy. This is not the full, you know, the full Shachrit or Mari or Mari service here. It is just it's these, these opportunities throughout the day to uh to to bless and express our, our gratitude um i'm curious to know so the, the title of the book is from gratitude to blessings and back um yet each vignette starts with the blessing and then some comment you know some comments about about gratitude or what we're looking for in these blessings how did you uh how did you decide to put gratitude um before blessings and then obviously return back to gratitude oh, Mara, <laughs> it, it, it could go either way <laughs> um and we talked about it a long time. I actually think this was the working title that we gave the publisher. And I'm not totally remembering if it was the one we really wanted, but they are cyclical. I mean, one one with the other. Could you say from blessings to gratitude and back? You could, you absolutely could. Um, but you had to have both. You have to have both. They balance each other. It only works to go from blessings to gratitude if you are focused on what the blessing is. If it's just something that becomes completely rote that you just do without thinking about it, then it doesn't invoke gratitude. So mm -hmm. the, so you it's easier to go from gratitude to blessings and back to gratitude than it is go than it is to go from blessing to gratitude. Um, and one other aspect of, of the cycle is um, you can't do a blessing that you're thinking about without also automatically invoking the holy and bringing the holy into the everyday. 
which is one of the reasons why it's sometimes really powerful and useful to say a blessing at the beginning because it changes the whole experience. Um, one of my favorites that's in this book is uh, one that was actually composed by a, a then student of mine, um, uh, Rabbi Jeremy Schwartz. Um, he said, he was the president of the student body at the rabbinical college at the time. And he said, there's something really wrong because we're getting together to do the work of the student body and that is blessed work and there's no blessing for it. So he went off and worked on it and ended up with a blessing that ends la'atzok b'tzorchei tzibur, um, to engage in the meeting the needs of the community. And um, it can be really transformative to say that blessing at the beginning of a committee meeting or at the beginning of a board meeting because it reminds people that the work that you're doing, even if it's something as mundane as dis deciding on the color scheme for a fundraiser, um, that the work you're doing is holy work. And when we remember it's holy work, we also treat each other differently during a meeting and that's worthwhile also as well. I just used it at a meeting with, um, at my board with, people who are not necessarily Jewish, not necessarily, that's an odd way to phrase it. And it, it made a tremendous difference. It wasn't that we were, I, I knew it was gonna be a pleasant, lovely meeting, but it was also the first time we met in two years. And uh, it changed the start. And, and it was a good constant reminder for all of us that the work we're doing is important work and brings in a whole nother, hard to say that God is a character at the table, brings someone into the room with you as you're talking and changes how you are. I've used it, we use this a lot. Uh, and it's one of the favorites that people always recommend. Another one of my favorite, as long as we're talking about favorites and other foods. Um, and, and, and for those of you who indulge, this is not for wine, so you don't have to say it over wine. And this is not a blessing of the standard blessings, but I'm gonna say it because I like it a lot. Also written by, some blessings deserve their own blessings. The standard ones never seem to do. Like fresh sheets or chocolate milk or taking a ride through a car wash on a sunny afternoon so it won't rain on the clean car. Or a cup of coffee, standing alert in a cheerful mug, greeting me at breakfast or a glass of iced coffee with the milk sliding between the cubes like white banners against the dark sky, or a cup of decaf with cream and sugar after dinner, rich enough to replace dessert, but kind enough to let me sleep. Some things, not everything, but some things discern their own blessings, like strong coffee, fresh bagels, homemade jam, preferably fig, and you. That was written by Rabbi Lewis John Aaron who writes lovely poetry, but coffee for me is a blessing. <laughs> and that bless, that would be said, by the way, it doesn't need its own blessing. So having just said that, it would be um, other foods and beverages have their own blessing. Thank you. So a lot of people, I think, a lot of people that I encounter sometimes have a hard time with the idea of a traditional blessing of saying Baruch HaTad Adonai, of, of, of sort of that which is fixed. Um, and yet I always encourage folks, I know you do as well in the book, to find your own blessing, to create your own. Um, tell us about the process that you go through in crafting your own blessings, you know, much like what you just shared with us, Marilyn, uh, you know, there is a blessing for other miscellaneous foods, the traditional blessing, but mm -hmm. there are ways that we can also create our own blessings as well. And, and how do we, uh, how do we encourage people to do that? Um, and what's sort of the, you know, you know, like the, the methodology that one might use to um, encourage people to write craft, say it, you know, write it out loud, say it out loud, simply say it to oneself to help 
um, really invoke a greater sense of, of sanctity and meaning in the everyday work that we're doing. The first thing I would say about that is um, some people don't like saying Baruch Atah, blessed are you, and there's no reason why they have to. Um, Marsha Falk, who's a wonderful poet, um, did an Amidah for me when I was starting to work on the a prayer book process in the 1980s. And that actually became the model for her book of blessings. Um, and she did finds Baruch Ata too male and too um, distance making. And she uses Nevarech et, let us bless whatever. And let Nevarech et en hachaim, let us bless the, the source of life um, instead of Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Um It's worth noting that all the, the Hebrew blessings can be divided into two categories. One is always contains the phrase Asher Kitshanu Mitzvotav Betzivanu, who makes us holy by um, God's commandments and commands us to. Um, and the others are appreciations for things that we receive. Um, so if you want to construct your own blessing, it's helpful to think about how do I want to begin it? And is it a blessing just of thanks, or is it a blessing in which I, rec I recognize that I'm being commanded to do something? Um, and you then, from there, add any ending that works for you. It doesn't have to be complicated. Um, keep in mind that the rabbis all along said, thanks God counts as a blessing. Um, so what language should it be in? Well, I really like using the inherited Hebrew formula, but you could recite that six line Hebrew formula, or six word rather, Baruch Atad and Eloheinu Melech Olam, and then switch to English to say what you wanna say. Or you could do the whole thing in English. Um, we, blessings are for the person who says them and for the people who hear them, uh, and whatever works is a good blessing. Thank you. Is it, um, let, let's go back a little bit. Um, I, I have a degree in art and then I ran an art camp. And the um, reason we started the camp was because kids were no longer learning how to use material to draw. They didn't know the fundamentals. So I kind of equate it this way. I don't think you can start to draw unless you know how to hold a pencil. <laughs> I don't think that if you go back to any of the great masters of Picasso, oh, great masters, Picasso, any of them who did abstract art, they started by learning the classics. So I really actually think you do need to know the basic formula first and then go off on your own. So uh, because once you know it and know what it means and how it's structured, then you have a good idea of where to start. Having just said that, I also believe that anything that would stymie your creativity would mean that you wouldn't do it. But for me, the who paints still a little bit, but I had to do the fundamentals first before I can go off the page, so to speak. So I understand what David's saying, um, that you should be able to say, the minute you say it and you say it of heart, um, you say it with love, then you know you've got something there. So it is, and there's a lot of stories like that. Uh, it doesn't matter what you say, which is not exactly true, but when you say it with meaning, uh, it's like another bad equation. When you are training a dog and, and you say to them, you have to use your face, you have to use all your emotions so they can hear, not just hear, but see what you're saying. So there's a very strong, fundamental thing we need to know before we can be creative, I think. I'm noticing that a number of people along the way have been raising their hands, yeah. so maybe we should give them a chance to jump Rather in. Rather than you just babble? Oh, it's silly. Chuck, you're muted. Sorry, I apologize, there you go. So I, yeah, um, if anyone has a question to ask, um, 
best bet would be to use the raise hand feature. That way you'll come to the front of the screen. Um, but I see Harriet also, she is at the front of my screen anyway. So um, Harriet, would you like to have a question or comment? I do a meditation on Wednesday afternoons and uh, in California. <laughs> uh, and um, what we do is uh, something creative pretty much, uh, although the basics are always there, the mindfulness and the breathing is always there, just like the prayers are always there. And I guess because Thanksgiving is coming along, we wanted to incorporate the idea of being grateful and the idea of the blessing of you know, being at peace and being in community because there are about 30 women that do this. Oh, well, we have two men, but a lot of women. <laughs> so what we did this week is we decided we were going to say what we were grateful for in conveniences. In other words, we have dishwashers and we have stoves that we don't have to, you know, start a fire with you know, to make it cook our meals. The conveniences such as those are what we said in very practical terms, what we were grateful for because it would make our Thanksgiving dinner a lot simpler. Mm -hmm. And then of course we talked about other things, but you know what? The response about the conveniences had a greater response than when we were talking about family and community, just saying it. Okay. Barbara, you were gonna say something, I think. Yes, I was. Thank you very much, David. Um, a, a couple of things came to my mind as the two of you were speaking. And that was um, many of the TV shows, when a Christian family sits down, they all say grace. Mm -hmm. Unless, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I can't remember any show where there is a Jewish family where they sit down and they say a blessing before um their meal not on tv okay um I, I feel grateful all the time i'm being honest i don't verbally say what i am grateful for but i am grateful every day um for everything that i have and when we are together as a large family which of course for the last year and a half we weren't able to do <clears throat> Um, we will say the blessings, you know, at holiday. And as Harriet was saying, with Thanksgiving coming, we always start our dinner with, you know, passing it around the table saying, you know, what are you thankful for? Um, and I, I just think that we as Jewish people um, come up short, you know, with expressing our, our gratitude. I, I agree everything you said. Um, I don't know that there is a regular Jewish family show like Leave it to Beaver and Father Knows Best. And But there have been some programs where they're gathered around. There's there's actually been some cartoon shows where they're gathered around and they say blessing. They say the blessing. Mm -hmm. um, so someday, maybe. Yeah. And I don't know. The only one I know that has a... Well, she, I don't know if, um, what was that one that was on? It was either Amazon, it was very popular. It's probably still on. If they said a blessing at any the, time. Un the unorthodox did. Oh, un well, the right. unorthodox did, but yeah. you know, there we're talking about a religious community. Right. You know, I mean, certainly they're not doing it on the Goldbergs. No. Um, you mean Keep the Goldbergs from when I was a kid? Kind was a you know, not those Goldbergs when we were either kid one. or the Goldbergs <laughs> of today either. <laughs> The kinds of Jews who end up in Hollywood tend to be extremely secular. So they are really not representative of the Jewish com uh, community as a whole. And I think that's why we have that issue. Um, I love the shows like NYPD Blue that show a Catholic family Mm -hmm. blessing on a regular basis mm -hmm. and that should be us because our tradition tells us that it's a critical part of who we are one of the characteristics of jewish prayer is that it spends vastly more time on gratitude and on wonder than it does on asking for anything mm -hmm. and um it, it's uh 
problem of the current American Jewish community that we've lost that connection. And it's one of the reasons why Marilyn and I wanted to do this book. Well, I, I definitely am going to get the book because one of the other things is, if I can say something, is Rabbi brought up about um, the Jewish camps. And my grandchildren over the years have attended uh, Camp Harlem and always come home. And, and my granddaughter aspires, who knows if it'll happen, to someday be a cantor. Um, but they come home gung-ho, you know, we're going to say the prayer. And I think that lasts a week, you know, Do and then get, all the, th that's hard. That's hard because we don't give the families, um, families could you go to camp and then everyone would say the blessing, but I'm mm -hmm. going to give you a tip about what the Hollywood has done for the blessing table. If you, next time you watch your family eat, they do this on Blue Bloods too, which David just talked about. My they, favorite. you don't, the, the four parts of the table there's always a place for the audience mm -hmm. so that you can sit at the table <laughs> so when they're saying the blessing uh in the magic of television you get it too so right. remember it's starting I, I, I think i think very often too marilyn is that in today's world everybody is just so busy to mm -hmm grab something to eat, whether it's as a family or, you know, this child's running that way and this one's running the other way, yeah. that the time is not taken, you know, to do that. Okay, I told, I get it. And that's why it's even, when you can gather them together, um, we did that, you know, dad came on 5.15, the dinner was on the table, we ate together, uh, blah, 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 blah. When fortunately we didn't know enough of the blessing to take time, uh, but we, we were together as a family. What a great opportunity. Even if you do it once a week and it doesn't happen to be on Shabbat. What is Thursday night pizza, whatever. We, and we take that little, that beautiful, those beautiful words and however we phrase them, whether we know them or not and say them and then start to use the other ones. The other ones are to say, I don't know how it's been out where all you all live. Y'all, this has been the most spectacular fall I have seen Gorgeous. and I expect it. So there are blessings for all of those things. The trees, the sky, the, tomorrow night we're gonna have a red moon. Tonight, and there is a blessing tonight. for the sky. Tonight. Fan, mm -hmm. tonight, tonight, yeah. at one, tonight after tonight. one, yeah, yeah, yeah. after yeah. one o'clock in the morning, we're gonna have a partial. You, you know what? 12, 12, 12 o'clock Central. You, 12 o'clock You tell me about it. Okay. <laughs> so um, my daughter, uh, has two-year-old twins and even before they arrived she and her husband always started dinner by each offering something they were grateful for and uh, to my great fascination now these two-year-old twins participate mm -hmm. i'm grateful for school I'm grateful for my mommy and daddy or whatever mm -hmm. happens to spring into their minds that day. Um, kids are never too young to participate in that. And part of the challenge is, is getting parents to take responsibility for making that a, a daily event. And um, it has remarkable power. Mm -hmm. I think part of it is also in the terminology that we use, because um, I think that a lot of contemporary Jews have difficulty with the idea of prayer or of thanking God or blessing God. And I'm wondering when, if we frame it differently, if we talk about how do we share our gratitude? I mean, I think everyone kind of gets around gratitude. I mean, I can't imagine, uh, my, I, Im I, I imagine that most of our Thanksgiving tables this year will begin with people going around sharing what they're grateful for. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and the one thing, the first thing on people's minds, of course, this year, we are grateful for simply being together because we weren't mm -hmm. together last year by and large. Mm -hmm. uh, but imagine if we did that every Shabbat, kind of mm -hmm. reflecting on the week that was, or even, you know, even every day. And if we were able to even mm -hmm. use the traditional Hebrew and create our own. Just think, just how 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 rich that could be. Um, mm -hmm. you know, as, re as you were talking before, I was reminded of a story that I heard um, 
Rabbi David Stern share. I think it was at a at a recent biennial. Whenever they used to have these URJ biennials with like five thousand people gathered in one room, mm-hmm. may, may that come back again. And he was telling a story of you know how. Um, you know, his father, um, uh, Jack Stern of Blessed Memory, was a, a prominent rabbi. And um, whenever they had a scholar in residence or a get, you know, someone, they would actually have a nice Shabbat dinner, bring out the china, sit in the dining room and everything like that. And one Shabbat, I think, as you know, you know, Rabbi Jack Stern asks, I'm not sure if it was Dave, Rabbi David Stern or other child. So tell us, you know, tell us, David, when, when do we say motzi? And his comment was, whenever we have company. <laughs> that <it> was, <laughs> and it was. I mean, it was the, it was the, it was the beautiful start to it, an, an extraordinary, um, extraordinary, um, uh, uh, not speech. Uh, yeah, I guess a speech that he uh, uh, comments that, that he shared with with the, with the plenary. But it was one of these things where, you know, sort of, you know, I mean, maybe, I mean, maybe in their house, maybe you know, Mozi wasn't said every day, and you know, I mean, some some do, some don't, some say it to themselves, some say it with their family. But there is a, we do have a great opportunity for that. I want to ask um, uh, just a question, because Marilyn, you started talking about this beautiful fall that we are experiencing in this in, and and whatnot, the colors and everything mm-hmm. that is here. Um, what's it like? Maybe both, you know, both of you can share a little bit. What's it like for you to just take a walk outside with this idea of gratitude and blessings on your mind because you have an entire section here obviously that shares blessings for wonders of nature whether it's for the trees or rainbows or oceans or seeing the least change or whatever it may be um how do you you know how do you manage to be in nature and be present with your environment and also find the opportunity to to share blessings as well actually i think it's easier yes because you know that there you are and there is something outside of you. It, truly nothing is more outside of you than nature. And there you are walking amongst all these things that you can't possibly understand, at least I don't understand. Uh, and it, it would, uh, for me, it's almost impossible not to be totally grateful for, I mean, I'm not crazy about the wind and the snow, but I do know they're part of what we need to be a fully functioning society and, and to live in a healthy world. So I'm grateful for the water I get to drink. And I, for we had six weeks without rain, you know, dancing in the street when it started to rain. Uh, and so it's, for me, it's almost impossible not to walk amongst, and I do walk every day. Um, and speaking of that, because I've been home since I got to see you guys last, um, don't feel sorry for me. I have been out and about. But what I have also noted when I am out and about are people I hadn't seen before that have lived here as long as I have. And for that, I'm extremely grateful for finding things out about me and my surroundings that I did not know before. So when you go out looking, you're generally going to find it. And that has to do with having an open mind and a closed mind. So, But that's another topic. I took a long walk in the woods yesterday and uh, the fall foliage was there and um, the sky was crisp. It was really a fabulous time. You could hear the crunch of the leaves under your feet and um, a whole range of blessings came to me as I was walking along both the natural ones and the interpersonal ones. Um, I, it's one of the ways you feel divinity enclosing around you and holding you. Um, and uh, it is a powerful way to connect, not just to the divine in the world, but to the rejuvenating powers that are around us that bring us energy and clarity and strength. So to be aware of all that um, and add the words of blessing to make yourself underline it and be conscious of it is um, a great gift to yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, Barbara, another question? Yeah, I I just, in adding to what you're saying, There was not a large group of us, but on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, 
rabbi took us um, for a walk in a local state park that we have here, Tyler State Park. I'm sure you've heard of it, David. And um, it, it, we, and this is why I say we don't always say it, but rabbi had us stop at one point and listen to the sounds that we heard. And we heard, you know, the leaves as they were, you know, it wasn't fall yet, but the crunch as we walked and the sounds of the birds and, you know, the airplane flying and all the things that when we're walking through the park and we're busy talking to one another, we, we don't hear that. Um, and the fact that we made it through <laughs> on the trail that we took, we were all very grateful, including Rabbi Briskin. Um, it, it was quite the challenge, um, more so than we had expected because it came after the flooding. So oh. there were down trees that we were not expecting. Um, and I, I think we all expressed the fact that we were grateful, you know, but here again, you, you don't do that when it, when it, I think it on a daily basis, you know, I truly do think it on a daily basis. I am grateful for every day and every, everything that we have, um, you know, we just, I, again, I think we just have to learn how to express it more. I took a, at, at another camp, I took the kids on a, families actually on a blessings hunt, treasure hunt so we stopped every time we saw something that had a blessing attached to it and mm -hmm. that made them aware of all the things that they're not normally aware of mm -hmm. so there is a lots of different ways to do that but i'll go back to my uh, original we chose to use the blessings that were already in place rather than create, there's only two blessings in this volume that are new ones. And they're also built on the same st standard format uh, on purpose to make them a part of the vocabulary again. Cause, and a lot of them are used in the morning blessings or what that were created for the blessings you say at home that have been moved into the sanctuary. Um, to, I said, so they're forgotten kind of too. The ones that we say when we wake up to thank God for the ability to see, um, the, to, the, they're just an astonishing array that we have forgotten about. And I want people to understand, we, David and I both, want people to understand that it's not just about us. We tend to be, myself included, self-centered. And we need to be somewhat self-centered so we can survive, but we also need to open ourselves up, not just to other people, but to the possibilities of being included in this great, amazing place that we were coincidentally dropped in on. So I ask people to think about starting by doing five blessings a day. Five blessings is not too strenuous. You can say when you when you get up, you can say one with each of your meals. You can say one after your meals. You can say one when you see something remarkable. Five blessings a day is a good place to start. And then you build up from there. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the adding of blessings and growing the number of them does have a remarkable impact on your life. I mean, what, two that I um, always say every day uh, are the blessing when I, for clothing, when I get dressed. It's really easy to take for granted all the clothes in our closets because anything that becomes routine is something that quickly becomes taken for granted. So, being conscious every morning as I'm putting on a shirt that it's remarkable that he, that this garment is here for me um, changes the focus of how I'm thinking about all the, the rush of getting ready in the morning for all the tasks of the day. And it reminds me to recenter myself about something that's much more transcendent than that. I'd like to say something. I don't, I don't know if you saw me raise my hand. Mm -hmm. We did. Chuck, you're muted again. Sorry. Is that Sue? Okay, go ahead, Sue. Yep. Two things. 
first of all, I still teach religious school, Hebrew school, fifth and fourth and fifth grade. And before I start my class, we get in a big circle. We say the Shema. I make them close their eyes and take three deep breaths in and three deep breaths and let the breaths out. And we sing the Shema. And then I tell them to talk to God and say what they are grateful for this past week. And it's so powerful and so profound, you could hear a pin drop. And the other thing that I wanted to say is my Bubba and Zeta lived with us and my Bubba was a very orthodox woman. So for many, many decades now, I am saying Moda Ani every morning of my life because that's what she taught me. And she had a blessing for everything. If there was a <laughs> rainbow in the sky, she would take my hand outside and look at the rainbow and say a blessing. We were all, she was always, she had a blessing for everything. And I think that upbringing has allowed me to continue to be grateful and to bless and not take for granted what I have. She was very, very um, passionate about everything. In fact, when I go down the shore every summer, I stand on the boardwalk and say, Shehechianu, because it, it boggles my mind, the heavens and the sea coming together. So I'm very, I guess because of my upbringing, very conscious of gratitude and blessing. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I, I say a blessing when I enter my house. Um, I say the Shema. The, and in, especially in these times, I've noticed that it's become more and more prevalent because coming home has changed in a variety of different ways. So walking inside my house now becomes, uh, I'm here, I made it, I'm home. So, um, and I know the Shema is on the doorpost of my house as well, but it's, it's changed a lot of things. So whether or not it be a, a uh, formulated blessing, but just an awareness of the blessed things we have. Uh, David's formula of five is awesome. If you got to five and you got no higher, that's all right. If you did three, if you've never done any, or if you just think about it, if you solidly think about what the possibilities are, how you become a part of it, it will change you. And, and to attach it. And we are not, I mean, I am, Sue, what a great way to be raised. I mean, I remember my grandparents and the different things they did and they taught me. And though they weren't blessings, there was never a day that I don't recollect something I learned from them. So I think there should be a blessing over the privilege of having known a grandparent who taught you things as the generations have. So keep those and those are blessings. Andy, and then we're going to wrap up. Hi. I was just going to say that, and you would think because I have a daughter who's a rabbi and a daughter-in-law rabbi that I have more structured type prayers, but I don't. I get up in the morning and I say something to myself because I'm by myself, you know, and um, I may see something during the day and I start to think about something. I'm looking outside my back window and I see deer and the fox that live in the woods right behind me, my property, and coming up to my gazebo. And I'm like grateful because they're always their company if I'm by myself. But it's like I'm saying a prayer that's definitely not structured. And it's something I'm saying from within myself. And to me, that's just as important as, of course, the Friday nights when I sit on services. Lately, I've been doing with Emily Synagogue in North Carolina or then late at night again with Josh and Lisa out in California. But I think it's important to have something within yourself. Things that came from, as you've all mentioned, your grandparents, your parents, things they taught you, things you saw and you admired in them and you put it in yourself. So for me, it's how you feel inside and you turn that into a blessing, into a prayer and say, thank you. That that's what's important for me. Absolutely. And we said it in, in a variety of different ways. The spirit in which you say it, when people are say blessings rotely, you, you just get used to saying them, but you really don't take the time to uh, understand the empathy that they need to be said with, then it doesn't mean anything. So yours do. 
and uh, uh, blessings on you. <laughs> yeah. the, the other um, thing that that raises for me is what happens when we really are immersed in gratitude, which is um, it provides the volition, the energy, the commitment to pay it forward. So real gratitude is illustrated by our willingness to give to others and to try to improve our world. So when we think about working on gratitude, it's not just because it enriches our spiritual lives, though it does do that, uh, and not just because it builds community, though it does that as well, but because it provides the motive energy for all the different kinds of gemilut chesed, deeds of loving kindness, tikkun olam, improving the world. Uh, a, a community full of blessings and gratitude is a community that joyfully does the work of, of making the world a better place. Amen. So uh, I want to just um, begin to wrap it up and just a reflection on something that you said, Andy. Um, mm -hmm. Thinking of whether it's the fixed blessings or the blessings in our mind, um, there's a great power in the practice of actually articulating the words, saying them out loud, even if you are by yourself, mm -hmm. um, of that conversation with God of just hearing your own voice say it, which I think um, deepens that sense of a blessing that we, that we can offer and expressing our gratitude throughout the day. Just being able to walk through the world with this great sense of awe and wonder of this amazing mm -hmm. gift that we've been given um, that we all too often take for granted or maybe reduce to sort of like the scientific elements that put everything together. Um, but we sometimes need to just pay more attention to the divinity within, within these. Um, I also want to comment on something that Barbara was saying before, um, with, uh, our, our contemplative walk called Torah on the trail. Uh, we actually are doing that. We, we do it not quite as regularly as I used to do it, but we are, we actually have one coming up this particular Shabbat um, at 8.30. So if you want a little shameless plug, if you want to join me, um, and others at 8.30 uh, at, at Tyler State Park for this, uh, you know, for a different way of, of connecting with Shabbat, you know, outside of the sanctuary, but really, um, you know, in nature as really focus on some of these blessings and bring in some of these, of, of these principles here. Um, and the last thing I would do, I think that we began with blessing and I think it's also appropriate to end with blessing. So I'm actually going to, uh, I think we began with the first or second blessing in the book. I'm actually going to the very last one here. Upon recognizing the spiritual and moral light within oneself or others. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Jasani Bitsalmo. Blessed are you, Eternal One, our God, the Sovereign of all worlds, who has made me in your image. And then this reflection. Seeing myself as a reflection of the divine image helps me to strive for greater spiritual awareness and greater ethical concern. When I recognize the divine in myself, I am more able to see it in others. And when I see it in others, it reminds me to, it remind, it reminds to me to appreciate it in myself. So let's look. Do we have a more. minute for me to read the story underneath? By all means, of course. The stone cutter did not like his job. It was hot, his work cutting into the rocks was hard and there was little glory. One day while cutting away at the stones, he saw a wealthy merchant ride by in a carriage. Oh, how I wish I were a wealthy merchant, he muttered. The moment the words left his mouth, he became a wealthy merchant. And life was good for a while. Then one day he saw the ruler of his kingdom and the people bowed to him. Oh, he exclaimed, how I wish I were the king. The moment the words came out of his mouth, he became the king and life was good for a while. Then one day while he was riding in his royal chariot, the sun began to beat down on him and he said, oh, the sun is much more powerful than I am. I wish I were that sun. The moment the words left his mouth, he became the sun and life was good for a while. 
Then one day there was a rainstorm and the clouds covered the sun and he wished he were the clouds as surely they were more powerful than the sun. And the moment the words left his mouth, he became beautiful clouds and he was happy for a while. Then one day the wind blew so hard that not only were the clouds blown away, but so was everything in their way, except for a rock that could not be moved. So he wished he was that immovable, powerful rock he became the rock and he was happy for a while. Then the day came when he heard the steady and sure sound of the stone cutter and he rejoiced that at last he had become what he was meant to be. Amen. Beautiful. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you. Thank you, David. What a pleasure um, just to share this time together. Uh, just a beautiful way doing this on a Thursday night as we enter into Shabbat. So I encourage us to find the blessings of the everyday, to recite the blessings of the everyday. I encourage you, if you haven't already, buy the book and buy, you know, buy multiple copies and give them to friends. It's just a really, just, just a, as Marilyn said, just um, something lovely just to keep by, you know, keep on your on your nightstand and pick up and read and and just you know, flip anywhere and just really enjoy the great wisdom that um, our uh, extraordinary guests and scholars and teachers share so again thank you Marilyn Price and thank you thank you uh, David Toy. thank you for so, so honored thanks to for having us of course thank you and thanks everyone thank you audience. all right all right Shabbat Shalom everyone we'll see you We'll see you soon. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, indeed. Yes. And Hanukkah while you're at it. Why not? <laughs>